follow him on up there. <laughs> follow him all the way. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We're going to pray this morning. Before we pray, I want to announce that um, we have found a fellowship hall and a Sunday school place <laughs> for us. Uh, some of you that don't know, we used to have a trailer right over here. We used to have a tent right back behind us, a 40 by 60 tent. And both of them, and Brother Michael went home. They were both needing lots of repairs, and we decided to just demolish them. So we've not had a Sunday school building since then, nor uh, we used to have vacation Bible school and our Christmas plays and all kinds of things under the tent. So we don't have really any facility for all that. So we found an, a building, and we're going to buy it. And uh, I just thought I'd give the church and anybody that watches an opportunity. If you'd like to help buy it, then you're welcome. Brother Jose is going to put an address on there that you could send if you want to help us. If you, I mean, we're not asking for it. We're just saying the Lord lays on your heart that you'd like to help us get that building. Well, go ahead. And some of you and anybody in the church, if you'd like to give a special offering for it, go ahead. Because it's going to be a blessing. It's going to be... Uh, some place that we can do vacation Bible school, but we're not going to do it this this year. But next year we'll have a good place to do it, and uh, we can just do a lot of things uh, in that building. It's going to be a very nice place for us for our church. Now, when we have any a kind of um, uh, dinner after the ground, you know, dinner after church, dinner on the grounds, we have to usually do it in right in here in our our church building. But we'll have that. So uh, that's coming, and when it, when it does, it's just a, it's a double wide shed actually, and uh, it's um, we we have to do some work inside to fix it up, and we got to put the electricity in. We need to put in a bathroom. I mean, we've got some work to do, and it's going to cost something. So anybody that wants to help, if you just feel that in on your heart that you'd like to help, you're welcome to. And uh, the Lord will provide. I'll just tell you that. We're not worried over it. We know the Lord's going to provide whatever we need. But I've just given you the opportunity to pray about what you, if you would like to give something on it. And this morning, if you, you'd pray about that and something else. I was okay. just saying, Jose, well, at the end of the service, Jose can tell us about, if, you, if you're out there and you don't know where to find the information, he'll tell us where to find that yes. information or address. Do you, do you have that right now, brother? Yeah. Come on, tell them. <laughs> we never take offerings. Yeah, we never take unless offerings. Unless it's for the um, minister here. So, for those of you who are looking, I know it's a lot of times I go onto our Facebook and I see people asking where they can, because I've heard people try to um, pay their tithes and you know give an offering whenever they feel like their heart is led to do that. Um, and in this situation, we try to find it, make it easier for you to find out where. Um, on the YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, there is a dis in the description box. There is a location where you can you can see our cash app. You can see our um, the address. And we have a post office. We don't have we have a physical address, but we can't get mail there and because of our postal system. Um, but we can get our PO box. It's listed in the in the description box. And if you're on Facebook, I mean Facebook or any other uh, social media where we are posting at, we will have a um, post up later on today where you can see the pictures of the uh, sheds and you can see where we can take donations for it if you are feeling heart led to to give a donation for that. And I uh, will be putting that up later on today. Thank you, Brother Jose. Praise the Lord. It's exciting. Uh, our, our church is, uh, we're growing in the Lord and uh, we're going in the direction I believe the Lord wants us to go in so we can, if you get, come see us, that we'll have enough of a facility for you to be, enjoy it when you come. And so, and us to have breakfast. Yes, we're going to, yes, we're going to, we're going to do that. We're, together. Yes, it's going to be a blessing. And uh, we're not worried, we're just glad that the Lord's pointed it, us to it. I'll tell you how, how this happened. Um, one morning I was walking around my yard and looked over there and the trailer was gone, the tent was gone and 
And I said, Lord, would you point us to a building? And I never had asked him to do that. But I said, would you point us to a building? And it was about 30 minutes later. <laughs> Lee said, Mama, I was just riding around. And she said, I found a building. <laughs> she did. And I said, well, that's amazing because I just asked him. And first time I'd asked him, actually. They didn't want to sell it. Yeah, they didn't want to sell it, but they did. Because of all the COVID things that had happened, they wanted to keep it on the lot, but I asked him to ask the boss. And he went before the boss, and the boss finally gave us a yes answer and gave us a price that was very affordable, thank the Lord. So, that, we know that it's the Lord leading us. We know that. So, um, and it's, it's going to be a blessing. But, um, you know, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm real happy about it. So, if you want to help, you're welcome. You know, and, and or just pray for us if you don't want to. Just want to, just want to pray for us that God will help us get it all together and, and uh, help Brother Don because he's usually in the charge of all that. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, you know, and, and and our brothers too, brother David, and brother Kevin, and brother Jose, and brother Bill. I mean, y'all, it's gonna come where y'all need to help us, and we we will need your help. And thank God for y'all. I appreciate y'all, and us ladies can do all we can do too. So let's let's see if we, let's see if we have any other prayer requests. Anybody got a prayer request this morning? We want to pray about. It. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead, sister. Okay. Brother David had to uh, is on the job today, um, traveling and to, to Chicago, right? Again, okay. And uh, Brother Henson needs our prayers. It's really tough to lose your wife after sixty-five. How many years was it? Sixty-five, 65 years after losing almost uh, a wife of sixty, almost sixty-six years. It's really hard for him and pray for him that the Lord would just strengthen him and talk to him and be with him and settle him and help him in every way, you know. Uh, like the Lord was with Sister Henson all her life, just transfer all that fellowship over to Brother Henson where he can feel the fellowship of the Lord in the house. That's what you need sometimes, lots of times. Okay, somebody else got a prayer request. Also, pray for my mom, my brother. And my stepdad, they all are getting over COVID. Oh, really? Even your brother that was so sick? He did Not that brother. Oh, his different brother. brother. His handicapped brother. Okay, your handicapped brother. Okay. So they all had COVID. And they didn't tell him. They told him they get getting oh. over it. Then they called him. Oh, my. Okay, well, we'll pray and believe the Lord for him. How many brothers do you have, Brother Kevin? Uh, two. two. Oh, three, yeah. Three brothers. Okay. And you have any sisters? No? Okay. Family of boys. Okay. Nehemiah? Yes. I do thank you. Praise the Lord. Somebody else got a prayer request. Thank you, Jesus. Remember all of Lee's. What your, tell your, us yours again. Especially remember Sister Becca. Um, she uh, is helping family members and going I need to be help, you know, to them that are hurt or sick, and um, she, her desire is to really be here and grow, and it's just not, the door hasn't happened yet, but pray that the Lord will just strengthen her and help her when we spoke with her this morning and pray for her, and um, I don't think she was riding into church, she said she'd see some of ours and watch it later, but um, she said, I've come too far to go back, and that's, the Lord gave you that song this morning, and we had yes. talked, so Please remember Sister Becca, remember Sister Cherie for healing and deliverance, and remember um, Sister Dory's parents, they were recovering from COVID. Remember her, remember um, Brother Joe Paulson, and remember Sister Angela. Okay. Remember Sister Annie over there with her, uh, with, with Angela and Jason and their, her new great grandbaby. Pray for the. Uh, I think they're they've gone to church this morning over at Sister Renee's church. So remember Sister Renee's mother. Yeah, remember Sister, Sister Renee's mother. She needs prayer. Somebody else got a prayer request now? Remember all my family. My um Uncle Bernard has his procedure on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So just remember him with that. And then um 
pray for the McLeese family. We're still going to help out a dad that passed away yesterday. Oh, you did? Amazing. So just pray for all of them. Okay. The Lord is comfort them. Okay. Remember Sister uh, Satters? Sister Beverly called me this morning, and I prayed for her. Sister Satters. She's in the hospital, and uh, she has to have a... a stent that they put in removed but the doctor is not available and she's in the hospital needing it so pray that the Lord would work help her and work it all out for Sister Setters Sister Beverly's mother and um, seems like I had someone else I really needed to remember uh, oh yes remember Sister uh, Angela people's her brother and sister and their family that God would touch that family and help them. Sister Angela's brother. Somebody else? Ashley? Okay. Yes. Somebody else? Anybody else? Will Cooper. Yes, remember my nephew. Yeah. Also remember Riley. Is she better? You know? She is. Okay. Remember Olivia, Brian, and Riley. Our other children that are far off, but Brian's, Brian's we love them also. dearly. Brian got it. Um, got it and that okay. Pray for them. They're they're our children. We need to keep them up and before the Lord. Anybody else? Anything else? Then my children be saved, and Sister Annie's children will be saved since mm-hmm. she's not here. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, remember Ann Orchard. Yes. Lord seems to be doing something. Yes. We'll see. I know that people, uh, Sister Beverly asked me about Aunt Audrey, but I didn't have an update. But uh, we're looking, we're believing the Lord's working. So y'all keep remembering Aunt Audrey. We'll also, see uh, Jessica's been tested for MS along with everything else she's already got going on. Mm-hmm. And I'm praying that it'll come back negative. Okay. And she's still got a little bit of shingles still, and she's fighting, but. Okay. You wouldn't know when you see her. She's yeah. always got a smile on her face, but yeah. she's got so much going on with her body. So. Okay. Pray for Sister Jessica and all of them. Yes. Jonathan and Sister Joyce and Brother Jim. Remember all of them. The yeah, remember them. Sister Hannah, she's she's like Netta, <laughs> going through this up until August, and then they're going to have their little babies. We're all going to have them. Okay, anybody else this morning? Okay, let's go to prayer.
So far, as we've gone through the tabernacle, is we've talked about the, the courtyard, right, and the outer fence, along with the gate, right? And we talked about this altar here, right, where they would sacrifice. And we talked about the labor, where they would cleanse the priests, keep themselves clean. And it's the same way with us, right? We go into God's court, we sacrifice to Him, right? We keep ourselves clean. 
right, as we're kind of following through this. And then we started talking about this and the physical building of this. We talked about the walls, and we talked about the roof cover, right? And now we're going to talk about a little bit about the interior parts of this. So we've talked about the outside of it. Now we're going to talk about the inside next, okay? So now we're down to these interior. And the interior hangings of the building, the, the stuff on the outside was kind of rougher material, right? It was outdoorsy kind of material. Um, you, when you go and you have like outdoor furniture, it has a certain quality to it. And then your inside furniture has kind of a finer quality to it, right? It's the same thing here. The interior hangings were of a finer texture than the roof curtains and the other materials um, that were made for the outside. The um, entrance curtain into whoops right here into the sanctuary part okay that's that's it was like a screen to, very much like the one at the front entrance okay very very similar in the way that it was constructed look at um Exodus chapter 26 <clears throat> Exodus 26 and 36. It says, And thou shalt make it a hanging for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen wrought with needlework. Okay? So, so that, was, that was what it was made of. And then in the front, it had these five pillars of gold along the front. Because remember, the front wasn't part of the walls, right? The walls just went to each side and along the back. They were hooked together into the sockets with the tenons and the mortises. Remember we talked about that? Pegged into place. So, so those side walls and the back wall were solid. The front was just these five pillars, and then there were curtains in between the pillars. In verse 37 says, And thou shalt make for the hanging five pillars of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and their hooks shall be of gold, and shall cast five sockets of brass for them. So the sockets of brass were for the bottom, right? And the hooks were to hold the curtains at the top. And it was really exactly like the one at the end of the of the court. It also had five pillars that were used. Now those pillars in the front, they were not covered with brass. I'm sorry, not covered with gold. Right? Only the things in the sanctuary were covered with gold. But it's very similar to the one in the outer court. Um, the hooks were gold, the sockets and tenons were brass or copper, and the assumption was um, that these were all in the same dimensions as well as the other curtains, right? It would make sense so that it would fill in the gaps correctly. Um, the wall drapery was different. Now, on the inside of the walls, there was also a drapery. So look at um, turn folk backward to chapter 26 verse 1. <clears> this <throat> is moreover that thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twine linens, blue and purple and scarlet, with cherubims and cunning work shalt thou make them. And the length of one curtain shall be eight and twenty cubits, and the breadth of one curtain four cubits, and one of the curtains shall have one measure. Every one of the curtains shall have one measure. So all the curtains were four cubits wide by twenty-eight cubits long. Okay? And what those did was those stretched across the walls. It was almost like wallpaper. Okay? Now why you would cover up golden walls with wallpaper, I don't know. 
but it's just me. I mean, you're maybe just me. Um, and, and the five curtains shall be coupled together one to another, and other five curtains shall be coupled one to another. And those couplings were with those loops that we talked about before, right? Loops, and then they would just fasten them together, almost like button them together. Now shall make loops upon, of blue upon the edge of one curtain from the selvage in the coupling, and likewise I shall make in the uttermost edge of another curtain in the coupling of the second. Fifty loops, again, fifty loops were what they used on the other curtains, shalt thou make in one curtain, and fifty loops shalt thou make in the edge of the curtain that is in the coupling of the second, that the loops may take hold of one another. Now so I made fifteen tashes of gold and couple the curtains together with the tashes, and it shall be one tabernacle. Okay, so that's how they did it. They took the loops and the little gold fasteners and they hooked the loops together and then they'd snap them together and that would fasten that whole thing together. And it was just one. And what was neat about it was if you had, again, we talked about with the outer curtain, but if you had all these curtains and they were all um, in one piece, so instead of it, you know, maybe it's 28 long and 16 cubits wide, they could have made that, right? But that would be harder to, to, for them to handle. Right? How are you, how are you gonna how are you gonna tote something like that, that would weigh that much? Right? It's very heavy. If you've ever again gone to a fabric store and picked up a bolt of fabric, it's not light. You know, it feels light on you, but it's not light on that bolt. Right? It's it's a lot of weight, and those those things can get very heavy. And so a lot of this was about the transporting, and a lot of it was so that if they had something. Um, go wrong with it for some reason, something happened to the curtain, then they could just replace that one piece, right? They didn't have to replace the entire curtain of everything, right? They could just take it out and put the other piece in. And then the hooks were gold, the sockets and the tenons were copper. And the assumption was that, that all of this was the same. So, so they had the, the drapery with the 10 pieces of cloth woven as the doorway screens, but in this case, they were only four cubits wide and 28 cubits long, and they were sewed together in these large sheets, two of them, and then buttoned with loops of the blue cords to the golden knobs in the walls, similar to the way that the roof curtains were fastened as well. Um, look quickly at 30, chapter 36. <clears throat> and we'll start in verse 8. The Bible says, And every wise-hearted man among them that wrought the work of the tabernacle made ten curtains of fine torn linen, blue and purple and scarlet, with cherubims of coming, cunning work he made, made he them. The length of one curtain was twenty and eight cubits, and the breadth of one curtain was four cubits. The curtains were all of one size. He coupled five curtains one to another, and the other five cur curtains he coupled one to another. And he made the loops of blue on the edge of one curtain from the selvage and the coupling. Likewise, he made the uttermost and the other side of the coupling and the coupling of the second. Fifty loops made he in one curtain, and fifty loops made he in the edge of the curtain, which was in the coupling of the second. The loops held one curtain to another. Kind of repeats itself, right? But... This is what God was doing with that, with Moses and trying to explain to them exactly how he wanted this building put together. Right? He was very, very specific about everything he was doing. And really, when you think about it, we talk about these double curtains, and it's really a double house covering for every closed part of the structure, right? So there's a two-fold blanket of skins on the outside, like a weatherboarding we talked about last week, right? There's two-folded drapery of linen and wool on the inside, kind of like wallpaper or wainscoting, right? And then two-fold of canvas on the roof to protect it from the elements, along with the rear gable, like shingling of a roof. But all the front coverings were single covering. So it was almost like they were trying to, to it's, the, the symbolism of this is that 
Everything was doubled around the buildings and areas except for the gateways, the veils in and out. And those were made for access. And obviously, the, you know, the Bible says, you know, straight is the way and narrow is the gate, right? So, the, so they don't want you to come in just anyway. They want you to come in the front gate. They want you to come in the door of the sanctuary or the tabernacle, not some other way. And it's all guiding you from the front, from the entrance, all the way in until you can get into here. Okay? The um, side curtains that were in the walls on the inside of the sanctuary was also very um, much more adorned with things, like the cherubims and the fine needlework. Okay? They were very, very decorative. They resembled them in fabric and in quality, but the embroidery was what differentiated the inside wall curtains from the front and entry veil curtains. They were a lot fancier. The ones on the doorways were a little more simplistic, colored patterns and that kind of thing, right? Not a lot of detail work. The curtain hangings by the violet cords was established so that they would hang properly and that the total number of the knobs that were built onto the boards permitted everything to hang exactly and perfectly right. So that kind of covers the roof and the walls and the entryway. So now we're going to look at, there were three things that we're looking at in the next section. There's the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the candelabra. And we're going to look at those three. The first one is the table of showbread. So all three of these are in this front area of the sanctuary. Okay, just the front area. This was called the holy place. The holy place. Okay? This area back here with the Ark of the Covenant was called the most holy place. Okay? So you got the holy place and then the most holy place. So in the holy place, you had this table of showbread. And this was on the north side wall. Look at Exodus chapter 40 real quick. It kind of describes this. <clears throat> um, yeah, verse 22. And he put the table, a, the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without the veil. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. Okay, so he talks about this table. It was made um, from acacia wood. Look back at um, chapter 25, verse 23. I think that's what it is. And thou shalt make also a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make there to a crown the gold. I'm sorry, and make there to a crown of gold around about it. So, so this table is about two cubits long. So that was what, six feet ish, right? He said. One wide, so about six by three or by eighteen inches, one cubit wide. No, two cubits long, yeah, we three feet long, one foot wide, and one and a half cubits high. So it wasn't a very tall table, right? Just a little almost like a coffee table, right? Maybe a little big larger sized coffee table. It was covered with gold across the entire surface. And as a table structure, it had, you know, so just like a regular table. On the top, it had little sides, and it had the four legs. The difference, I think, is this crown, or this the moldings of gold that ran across the top edge of it, 
It was very ornate. Right? It wasn't just a flat top table. It had a, a crown all plated with gold. Um, it had a um, another piece to it. Look at um, chapter 37. This was kind of interesting to me because it's like, it wasn't that big a table. Why couldn't they just pick the thing up? Um, chapter 37 and verse 10, I think. can't read my writing. And he made the table of shittim wood. Two cubits was the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and the height was a cubit and a half was the height thereof. And he overlaid it with pure gold, and made thereunto a crown of gold around about. Also he made thereunto a border of an handbreadth round about. He made a crown of gold for the border thereof round about. And he cast for it four rings of gold, and put the rings upon the four corners that were in the four feet thereof. And over against the border were, uh, were the rings, the places for the staves to bear the table. And he made staves of shittim wood and overlaid them with gold to bear the table. So, so here's this little table. And we, like I say, it wasn't very big. It was overlaid with gold, so it was probably a little heavy. But I don't think it was something that couldn't be handled. But... Just like they did on the um, altar, they put these rings on it, on each of the four legs, and then they had two rods or staves, and they would fit those through the rings, right? And then they could pick it up by the rods and carry it. Now, if the table was full of bread and whatnot, it'd be hard to move because the loaves were actually pretty large size. We'll talk about how big the loaves of bread were, but um, it wasn't it was simplistic and durable it wasn't really a small table but I would think fully loaded with all the gold and everything the estimates are probably weighed a couple hundred pounds right so it sounds like it's a little table but it's probably pretty hefty to tote and that's why they have the stage with the rings and the other things it also was made of gold you didn't really want to drop that right you don't want to bust anything up. Right? It was a very delicate kind of a thing. And notice that everything in it was gold. Even the gold, the, 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 the stays were covered with gold. Everything gold, gold, gold. Right? The closer we get to the most holy place, the more we see gold. See less and less silver and brass and copper. Okay? We're just going to see gold from here on in. Everything's going to be made of gold. And it's and it's and it's kind of symbolic too because the the closer we get to the holiest areas, the more the finer the materials are, right? On the outside we start with fur coverings, we move our way into hides and move our way into linens. Right? Or if we think of it in the, in the, the other, you had the copper, the brass, you had the silver, and then you have the gold. Right? And it's the same thing with us. Right? You've got man, and then you've got Jesus, and you've got God Almighty. Right? And access through to the things. Now the bread that was placed on there, obviously something called the table of showbread, had to have bread, right? It was... Um, in the in the Hebrew language, the, the name is face bread or show bread because it was set before God's presence. It was set in the presence of Jehovah in His face. Face bread. We were showing Jehovah the bread, show bread. It's kind of where the word roots from. Um, look at. I think it's 25 and 30. Look at 25 and 30. Let's see what that says. Hmm. 
Yeah, and thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. That's kind of all he says there. And then look at Leviticus 24. I just read this the other night. Twenty-four and do, 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 do. Chapter, verse five. And thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof. With two tenths deal shall there be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in six in two rows, six in a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. That's that table of showbread. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even for an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And every Sabbath he shall set it before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the, ho most ho in the holy place, for it is most holy unto them, for him for the offerings of the Lord, made by fire, by a perpetual statute. So, so it was made of this fine wheat flour, right? And it was lightly beaten. It was baked into 12 loaves, right? Which, um, it says, it, it, it makes it about an ephah of flour. And, and that's about 12 quarts. That's a gallon of flour in one loaf. Now, when you bake a loaf of bread, how many cups of flour do you Cups, just a couple of cups, yeah. right? And now we've got what is it, eight cups and a quart, and four or thirty-two cups of flour for one loaf of bread. These were not like the store loaves of bread. That's what I'm trying to get across here. This was a big loaf. This was a large loaf of bread. Okay, because when we say you know a loaf, we think what we think of. Even even the little mini, you know, loaf pan loaves that are only a few inches long, you think. You know, the bread at the store is a little longer. This was large. This was a very large loaf of bread, okay? <laughs> and it would have weighed between probably 12 and 14 pounds each loaf. Okay? So it's 15 pound loaf of bread. Now, look at um, look at First Samuel chapter twenty-one. We read this story often, and I don't know that I I didn't really understand the significance of this. Verse one: And David then came David to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? And David said unto Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee and what I have commanded thee. And I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Where... For what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what there is present. Five loaves of bread. Now, if each of those loaves weighed 15 pounds apiece, that's a lot of bread. It's a lot of carbs. Now, was this just for David? No. It was for David and all his men. How many men did he have? A couple of hundred? Okay? So this was not a small amount of bread on the table of showbread. And they would bake it every week. Every Sabbath they would replace the loaves with new loaves. The priests wouldn't eat the loaves until after they were taken out of the view of the Lord. So they would put the new loaves in on Sabbath and they would take the old loaves out of Sabbath and then they would be distributed to the priests and the priest's sons. Okay? And then they would eat it that. So they're basically all eating week old bread. You say. So they didn't even get the fresh bread, they got the old stale bread. <laughs> the week old bread. Um, well, welcome to the clergy, right? Um, 
<laughs> so the loaves <coughs> were, um, so, so these loaves, he's just these five loaves, right? There's no common bread in verse 4 under my hand, but there is the hallowed bread. If the young men have kept themselves, at least for women, David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there is no bread there but the show bread, and it was taken before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. So again, the men got whatever was taken away when it was replaced by the other bread, right? And then we talk about the, like, the Edomite and that whole story. But just to say, these five loaves, not out of the twelve, he only asked for five, but it was to feed his hundreds of hungry soldiers, right? There's a lot of bread, just in five loaves of bread. Now, the loaves were baked in golden pans, and every Sabbath day, the hot new loaves were placed on the table. The old ones were removed and eaten by the priests. Uh, there was an interesting commentary that I read from, and it said that the bread being removed from the week prior was still hot, as if freshly baked. Don't know how that would happen. But that's what they say in the commentaries. Um, that was part of the miracle of the showbread. Was the, it was still just as fresh as the day they put it out. It wasn't dried out. Um, they were raised in two rows of six loaves. These were symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it also supported the dimensions of the table. So when you add up the area, you have about maybe four to five inches on one side and about nine inches at each end that were still there, and all the rest would be covered by the bread based on the size of two cubits by one cubit. Okay? Um, it's generally agreed that the bread rested directly on the table. There wasn't any plate or cloth or anything between the bread and the table. There's no, no mention of that in the Bible. It, the only other substance that's mentioned on the table is this pure frankincense that they put on there. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But some references uh, talk about a covering of blue, but I think it's really not really uh, a relevant thing. Look at Numbers 4 and 7. It says, uh, and on the, upon the table of showbread there shall spread a cloth of blue and put thereon dishes and the spoons and the bowls and the covers to cover with all and the continual bread shall be thereon. So there they do talk about the cover of blue on the table of showbread. Okay. So, but that's the only place in the Bible that it mentions that. But really, it doesn't say that the bread was on that. It says that the other dishes and the other pans were on that. So some people said that there might be a, like a lower shelf, and on the lower shelf was the blue where they would have the pans and the different the utensils and things on the lower part of the cocktail. And on the top of the showbread was just the bread. Because when you put the loaves on, there was only four inches on the sides and nine inches on each end of extra space. So where are you going to put the pans and the utensils? There's no room on the top if you filled it up with bread, right? Now, the, the family of Koath, or the Koathites, were responsible for the transportation of all of the items. And, and whenever the camp would move forward, um, look at verse 5 in chapter 4 of Numbers. And when the camp set forward, Aaron shall come and his sons, 
They shall take down the covering veil and the covering, cover the ark of the testimony with it. And shall put there on the covering of badger skins and shall spread over it a cloth holy of blue and shall put in the staves thereof. This is how they move the Ark of the Covenant. So before they do that, they take the curtains down, they wrap up the Ark of the Covenant with it and with part of the roofing material so they would be protected when they would be moving it. But that was their job, right? And they would take all of those, they would take the, the showbread and they wrap it in the blue cloth and then they would move it. And that would include the packing of the spoons and the bowls and the dishes. When they got all the stuff from the kings and the... Who did they get from the... The Egyptians. The Egyptians. Yeah. They were used as, like, goblets and jewels and things of that nature. So when they got it, Moses' people used it for durability, not adornment, do you think? <clears throat> Like the gold they they actually did use it for adornment in the beginning, because remember um, later Moses tells them to take all their jewelry off uh -huh. to humble themselves. Okay. Okay. Um, the first thing they made with the jewelry and all the goodies that they got was the golden yeah. calf. Mm -hmm. Which is what got them in trouble. Yeah. Well, um. And then they gave willingly to the building of these elements. So all that gold for all the walls and all the sockets and the silver and the, the, everything was given and melted down and done by the materials that they brought out. Which really shows how much the, the Egyptians gave them to get them out of there. All right, back to the frankincense. So let's look at the, the, the meal or the grain offering. Look at um, Leviticus chapter 2. Verse 1. And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, its offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense thereon. So this is what I talked about a little bit at the very end of the thing last week, right? Where I had um, come across this about the meat offering, which is really grain. Right? The offering is grain or flour and oil, finely ground flour. And it's covered with oil, and it's mixed with frankincense. And then they were prepared in an oven. So look at verse 4. And thou shalt bring an oblation of a meat offering, bacon in the oven. It shall be unleavened cakes of flour mingled with oil, or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. And if thy oblation be a meat offering and a bacon in a pan, it shall be of fine flour, unleavened, mingled with oil. And thou shalt part it in pieces and put oil thereon. It is a meat offering. And if thy oblation be a meat offering, bake it in the frying pan. It shall be made of fine flour with oil. Then verse 9 shows it being burned on the altar. And the priest shall take the, from the meat offering a memorial thereof and shall burn it upon the altar. Altar. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Now, how many of you ever baked rolls and burned them in the oven? I'll just put my hand up, right? Everybody? everybody somebody. My sister, that was her contribution every Thanksgiving was the burned rolls. That was her thing. Um, but the intent of this was as an offering that contained no sin, right? Because the bread and the flour and all that was not like the sin animal, like the goat or the bullock or the, you know, any, any of those things. It represented um, the, 
us in perfect obedience where we're giving God sacrifice that he accepts and it's pleasing to him. It's got a good fragrance. Now, burned rolls don't generally have a good fragrance, right? But when we talk about the oil and the, especially the frankincense, frankincense is an essential oil, right? You can order it today in little bottles, right? And, and it is a very fragrant thing. I don't particularly like the fragrance of it. It's kind of strong to me, but that's me. But it is an essential oil. It has health benefits. It has all these things. And it also had a certain amount of preservative actions. Frankincense was one of the things that they would use in the bodies of the people that they would anoint the bodies with to help try to preserve them, like embalming type things, okay? I know it's kind of gross for early in the morning, but <laughs> the, again, the bread was to remain there for seven days all by its lonesome. And they didn't have like all the fancy preservatives we have now that are jammed into our foods, right? So frankincense was one of those things that acted as a preservative as well. And it has a free, free, uh, sweet fragrance, almost like a like honey has a sweet taste, but the effect of the heat has a different effect on um, on each thing. Heat can do two things. It, it, it can corrupt or break down honey and destroys it, but frankincense, when it's heated, doesn't break down. It just releases more of its fragrance when it's heated. So that's where the sweet savor that the Bible talked about was coming from, from the bread. When they would burn that on there, it wasn't about the burning bread. It was about the release of the fragrance of the frankincense that was in the bread that was making that sweet savor, that was pleasing to the Lord, the Bible says. Some frankincense um, could have been added to the vessels, um, so that they would be accessed for use at the altar of incense later. And we're going to talk about the altar of incense next. Um, we haven't really talked about, but there were things that uh, the priests used these things called censers. Um, I'll show you this picture. Right, this priest down here in the corner has this little thing hanging from a chain, and it would burn stuff. Okay. That was burning an incense or a perfumey thing, and it would release this smoke. And they would take that and they would swing it, you know, like this, and it would release and make the fragrance go around, right? That sweet savor. Um, there were different utensils that were connected with the table. There were jars or deep vessels that were used to store the um, oil for the candelabrum that we're also going to talk about later. There were vessels that had a narrow opening at the top so you could pour them. There were jugs that contained um, whether it was wines or pitchers or bowls. I mean, all of these things were in here and they were generally on or around the table of showbread. Now, none of these seem to have um, any handles or covers on them. Although um, there were probably something like a plug or a cork or something that was used to seal the top. Um, but it does appear that they were intended, not intended to hold anything other than very small quantities at any given time. They weren't really meant for long storage, right? They would have just enough for what they needed for the current time, and then they would be refilled somehow, right? From without the camp, probably. And then there were um, saucers that were used for the incense. So it's kind of it's kind of confusing, but they wouldn't pour the in, the frankincense directly on the bread. First of all, frankincense is nasty tasting. Okay, <laughs> it might smell good, but it does not taste good. So it would make the bread taste horrible, right? But what they would do is they would take these saucers, and the way the bread was baked, they had an interesting shape. It was almost like a U-shaped 
the top of the loaf was like indented in the top. And then they would take these saucers of frankincense and they would put them filled with the frankincense and they would put these little saucers, there'd be about four of them on each loaf. Okay, so they would just put these little saucers in around, and they would take the vessel and they would pour the frankincense onto the little saucers. And again, it was all about the aroma. It was all about the release of that. And then whatever remained, they would use the remnant of that, or when they replaced these saucers after the week, Right? They would pour them into another vessel and they would use them the following week on the altar of incense as one of the things they would put on the altar of incense. So there wasn't a huge amount of room on the table for a lot of things. Right, Maybe two of each kind of thing. Two for the oil, two for the frankincense, a stack of the saucers, that kind of thing. So then the other question, and we kind of read it earlier, but I'll kind of stress it now, is was the bread leavened like we think of a loaf of bread? Because it's kind of hard to get a loaf of bread that puffs up to make that U-shape, right? Um, the, the scripture uses the word lechem, or bread, and it could have been made with leaven, but if it were to be not leavened, then the scripture would have used the word Matzah, which is unleavened bread. But the word matzah is never used to describe the showbread. Similarly, um, God commanded uh, some things about the observing of Pentecost. Look at the big, little, 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 Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. In the morning. <coughs> 23 and verse 17. And you shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be of fine flour, should be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits of the Lord unto the Lord. And ye shall offer with the bread, seven lambs without blemish of the first year, one young bullock and two rams, and they shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord, with their meat offering and their drink offering, even made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Then shall ye sacrifice one of the kid of the goats for a sin offering, and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of the peace offerings. In verse 20, and the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord. With the two lambs, they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. So here he's describing that that, that is definitely leavened. And leaven is something that makes the bread change, right? When you start out and you put that yeast in there, which is the leaven, then when it starts out, it looks one way, and then you cover it up, and you come back an hour and a half later, and it looks completely different, right? It's like much, much bigger. Like, wow, well, what happened? Um, and leaven is not synonymous to sin. A lot of people try to make leaven and sin the same thing. It's not. It's not the same thing. Leaven bread is most is the most desirable bread of all, right? Because it it really. Its nature has been changed by the yeast. Right? It's, it's not the same dough as it was before it was leavened. It changes into a new thing altogether. It's the leaven of our faith. Right? A small lump leaveneth the whole loaf. Right? A small bit of leaven can leaven and change a lot of things. This is like the Spirit of God, how it changes our human nature into that divine and holy nature. That's the leaven. That's the leaven. So he wants that. They want to show God that leavening. God prefers to have that um, leaven of prosperity versus the unleavened adversity or affliction. Right? He wants us to prosper. 
Now, there are talks, and, and we don't have time right now, but there are scriptures. Look quickly at Deuteronomy 16. We'll just look at one of them. There's actually three different. But there is talk about unleavened bread, which is the bread of affliction. Right? But the show bread was going to be the bread of prosperity, not of affliction. Uh, Deuteronomy 16. My fingers are not working today. 16 and 3. And thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, and thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. So here they talk about specifically eating unleavened bread, but that's to remember the pain and the affliction and the suffering that they did when they came out of Egypt. The table of showbread was put before the Lord, right? That bread was there to, to show our prosperity, how we had changed from when we came out of Egypt. So it was leavened. Okay? So that's the difference between the leavening and the unleavening. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about showbread uh, next week. And then we'll work our way on to the altar of incense. Amen. Good morning.
page 46. Okay. Help me with this one. It's been a long time since I sang it.
this morning because I believe that we all really want to go in the rapture. Really want to see Him finally face to face. And we, we feel His Spirit. We know that He's with us. But we want to be able to go and be with Him. So I'm going to read in verse, uh, starting in verse 52 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, In a moment, uh, verse 51, excuse me, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which give us up the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Sister Barbara, will you pray for the message, please? Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We ask you to anoint Sister Linda to give her the word that we need to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Hallelujah. This morning I want to preach a message about being ready for the rapture. Hallelujah. And I, I'm not going to try to uh, get you to wonder if you're saved or not. I know that I guess everybody in here is saved. But I want you to look at your life about living until the time of the rapture. I want you to li look at how you're living and uh, if you can live in such a way that no matter when the Lord comes, you're ready. No matter when He comes, you're ready. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to start right there to help you to look at your life and look at what, what you're doing with your life now and to see if what you're doing is 
probably what you need to be doing while the rap, when the rapture comes, when the Lord comes. We're going to start in verse 14 in chapter 4 of Ephesians. It says, That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up unto Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So the first thing that this portion of Scripture tells us is that He wants us to not be carried away by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men. In other words, their uh, deceitfulness and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie, they lie in wait to deceive. He wants us to follow after Christ and speak the truth in love. He wants us to be willing to live day by day like that. Day by day. Following after Jesus. Doing the things that He would want us to do. I don't know if you've ever slowed down enough. Because we all live a fast pace. But I don't know if you've ever slowed down enough to really look at your own life and see how am I doing this? How am I living this life? Am I living this life following Christ? Doing the things that He wants me to do? Being pleasing in His sight so that if He comes any second, any moment, that I am ready. That I am ready. Because He is going to come in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. It's only going to happen one time and it's going to happen very quickly and so fast that if you, you might not even know it happened if you're not ready to go. You might not even know it happened. It's going to happen very quickly. But God wants us to be living in such a way that we won't need to worry if He comes in the middle of the night and we're asleep. We won't need to worry it because we're living such a way. I'm telling you something. The enemy is on our trails every day. He's trying to drive us to the place where we don't sit down and really take stock of our own lives and say, what kind of life am I really living? What kind of life am I really do? I mean, how am I managing my life? How is this? How am I doing about living for Jesus? And sometimes you just have to slow down and you have to think about your life. And you have to let the Word of God speak to you. He said, but speaking the truth in love, that you may grow up into, into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So that you, instead of, um, I'm saved now, but I'm still the same. I'm still the way I once was. You cannot do that. You cannot still live like you did before you got saved and, and be ready for the rapture. And this is my message to warn you that it's only going to happen once. It's going to happen in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. And there is such a thing as being ready. You've got to be ready. You can't say, well, next week I'll try to get ready because that next week will never come. Next week I'll try to Change. I'll try to be different than I've been all this past week because I know I didn't even think of Jesus. I didn't even care if He came. I wasn't concerned about that at all. Let me tell you, Jesus is coming and He wants you to be ready because He wants you to go with Him. Hallelujah. He doesn't want us to be just turned here and there by the wind of, winds of doctrine and slights of men and cunning craft, craftiness. They're lying in wait to deceive. They want to deceive you, Bill. They want to get you to thinking that I don't have to think about Christ. I don't have to think about Him. I can think about politics. I can think about everything else that's going on in the world. I don't have to consider what my life is really like for Him. Yes, you do if you want to go. If you're wanting to go. We're coming down to a time where it's going to happen any day now. We know it's going to happen any day now. If I was not trying to teach you what you ought to do to be ready for His coming, I would be no kind of pastor at all, would I? But I am your pastor. And He says that we I want to come to the place where we grow up into His head. We're His body. 
where we actually become a part of Christ, where we are somebody just like He wants us to be. Not just somebody like we want to be, but what He wants us to be. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. You and I are part of the body of Christ. Are we? Are we? Are we going out here into somebody else's head? Let somebody else show you what you ought to do and how you ought to live. Instead of growing up into the head of Christ. Jesus wants to teach you. He wants to show you how He wants His bride to be when He comes to get her. And her is not just her. Her is some he's too. He wants to come get you. He wants you to be ready. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Let that little phrase sink in. The vanity of your mind. In other words, your mind is not on anything serious. Your mind is not on anything that has to do with being ready for the, the rapture, being ready for the Lord. Your mind is on every little anything that can take you away from that. And you are completely immersed in this world. And you're not thinking of, of Jesus, nor thinking of going with Him when He comes as a practice. You may think of Him once a week or so and think, well, I would sure love for Him to take me when He goes. But it's not a matter of you trying to grow into His head, be a part of His body, and be in His head. And God wants you to think on these things today. He wants you to think on... Walk, walking with Jesus, not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the love of life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. That's some tough words, aren't they? That's some tough words for God's people. But if you see this as the book of Ephesians, it was a letter to the church in Ephesus. It was a letter from Paul to them to try to make them understand that you can be this way. You can have your understanding darkened and probably will if you're not careful. You can be alienated from the life of God. You can go about your life never even feeling that Jesus is in your life or God is in your life through the ignorance that is in them. And you can go around with a blind heart. Who being past feeling, having given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. Jesus is not like that about you. He doesn't want you to be like that. He doesn't want you to be past feeling, having given themselves over unto lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is, is all those uh, things that work on the flesh of man. All those things that draw the flesh of man. You know, in the world they use those kind of things to sell things. Advertisements. They'll have a woman up there that's part, very scantily dressed so that you'll look at that advertisement. That's, that's lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is that that uh, calls to the flesh to come after it. That causes lust to come into your heart. It, being past feeling, having given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. I'm going to do wrong so that I can have money. I'm going to do wrong so that I can be a success. It's the only way I know to do it. But Jesus told them, but ye have not so learned Christ. This is not the way you've learned Christ. 
If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. You can go that way of being blind in your heart and going wrong and never considering your life and what it's really uh, what your life is really like before Jesus. You can do that. But this pastor is telling you, your mental life is important. I don't know what all your mental life is like because I'm not inside your head. But Jesus is. And He's trying to warn you. He's trying to say, if you want to go with me when you come, something's got to change. Something's got to change. All of this blindness of heart, being alienated from the life of God, your understanding being darkened, all of this vanity in your mind, you've got to turn it over and you've got to be willing to think in a different way and look at everything differently. Because listen what it says. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. You put that old man off. The old Linda has got to die. i got to put her off. She can't... I can't go that way anymore. I'm just using myself for an example. You can use yourself and say the old and you name your name. The old man, the old woman, the old girl or the old boy. He was corrupt according to the deceitful lust. He, Jesus gives you this advice. Put that off. Put it off. Put it off. If you're wanting to go in the rapture, Put it off. We don't have time to quibble about it. We don't have time to say, well, I don't know if I can do that or not. You can do it. It's going to take you reading the Bible and taking it seriously. It's going to take, it's going to take you be, being willing to, to uh, uh, swallow a little bit of something that's not just, uh, Jesus loves you now. He's alright with everything you do. No, you don't need that. You need to hear the Word. And the Word tells you, He said, If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Judgment's beginning at the house of God. It's time for you to judge your own self. You don't want anybody else to judge you. You won't put up with it. How often we hear, don't judge me. All right. I don't want to judge one of any of you. Any I'm talking to. I don't want to judge you. I just want you to judge yourself. I want you to come down to your own mind, your own ways, your own thoughts. And I want you to get uh, down serious with yourself and say, do I actually feel like I am living like Christ would have me to live? In my mind, am I doing it? Am I actually what He wants in a bride? Come on. Come on. Am I living that way in my mind? Am I living that way? Or am I just doing my own thing like I've always done and now naming the name of Christ? And when it comes down to the place where he picks out who he's going to take home with him as his bride, will he leave me behind? Judgment must begin at the house of God. Those that say don't judge, they never, they never speak that, that verse, do they? 1 Peter 4 and 17. They never speak that verse. They never say God's house is going to be judged first and then the rest of the world is going to be judged. God's house. When you come to God's house, you came for help, didn't you? This is it. This is the help you need. This is Jesus. He's the Word of God. He said, don't let your mind be darkened. Don't you don't let yourself be ignorant. Don't let your heart be blind. Don't let it happen. Get down to business. Curb your thoughts and get your mind on the Lord and realize if I'm going in the rapture, 
I've got to lay some things down in my mind. <clears throat> some of young people wear a headphone so they can listen to any music they want to. And nobody knows. But Jesus knows. And when He comes, can you imagine Him calling you? Saying, not good enough. Not good enough. Too worldly. Too full of vain thoughts and vain ways. Didn't want to love me. Wanted to love themselves and have it their way. Sister Linda, you're so mean. Yes. I mean on the devil's ways. I hate them. They're going to keep us here when the Lord comes. Do you want to be in the tribulation? Do you want to go through all of that? If you do, keep on being the way you are right in here. Because right in here is where Jesus is looking at, seeing and knowing. He knows. Come clean with Him. Let Him know, I've got to get my mind under control for you. Please help me. Please help me. I don't know what to do. I've always just let my mind run wild. I've always just let it run wild. I've never had it tamed. I've never had it make me draw it in. You know, I've never let my mind be helped by somebody else. I just reject whatever they say and go on thinking the way I think. I'm telling you, you better quit it if you're going into rapture. Because Jesus knows the innermost thoughts of our hearts and our ways. He's not willing for us to stay that way. He wants you to hear this word today. And He wants you to start doing something about it. You have not learned Christ. You have not learned Him in the way of being lascivious and greedy and blind in your heart and darkening your understanding. Hallelujah. Not letting anybody ever tell you anything that ever really matters to you because you've got your own way of thinking and looking at things. It's the truth. You're going to have to learn. You're going to have to be willing to say, God, I'm going to study your word and I'm going to learn your ways and I'm going to give up my ways. Help us, Lord. Yes, sir. I'm going to lay the old man down. Yes. I'm going to quit being proud of the old man. Right. Come on. The old man is nobody to be proud of. Right. The old man is going to keep you in the, here and you're going to have to go through the tribulation because of the old man. No, you better throw him down and say, I'm through with him. No Hallelujah. No Glory to God. God told me this morning judgment must begin at the house of God. If I'm going to be Christ. I'm going to have to start growing into his head. He said, you, he, he said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. What does that mean? It means that all that sap, all that goodness, all that life of Christ wants to grow into you and make you just a branch of himself. That's what a a husband and a wife are. What a bride and the bridegroom are. They are one. Jesus wants us to be one with Him. And in order to be ready for the rapture, if we've never accepted that, if we've never been willing to go that way, if we've only said, well, I'll be saved, but I'm going to hold my own ways. That's what Job said, but he didn't know Jesus. I'm going to hold my own ways, brother. You can't hold your own ways, can you? You've got to say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. You've got to say, Get, let the sap grow up in me. Let me be part of the, of the vine. Let me just be a branch of the vine. Right. Oh, hallelujah. People, they'll look at you and they'll scorn you because you're so heavenly minded. They'll say you're no earthly good. And they're so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. Don't listen to that. 
I told Sister Tammy the other day uh, about a preacher. I said, when he preaches Christ, he's right there with you. You can feel him right there with you when he preaches Christ. Jesus. Why? Because Christ was growing up into his mind and his life. And what we need, we need to see Jesus, don't we? We need to see Jesus in people's lives. How are we going to see him as long as they think they're better than Jesus? For me, I'm better than Jesus. No. For you, Jesus is better. For every one of us, Jesus is better. Humble yourself and tell Him you need Him to somehow help your mind to be what it ought to be. Hallelujah. He said that, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Have you ever preached this, Brother Stephen? Parts of it. Maybe not just like that. Right. I'm just saying, it's right here in Ephesians. It's been always been there. It's always been there. But we, we don't look at it. Oh, that's just one of them boring letters that Paul wrote. No, it isn't. It was absolutely necessary for the Ephesian church to pay attention to it. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, sister and brother. Oh, Lord, I pray that I'd be renewed in the spirit of my mind. What in the world is the spirit of your mind, Bill? What is it? You didn't even know you had a spirit in your mind. The spirit of your mind. The spirit of your mind. What kind of life are you living? What kind of mind do you have? Where is the spirit of your mind? What is it like? You need to find that out. You need to acknowledge to yourself, this is the way I think. This is what I think about. This is what I'm doing. Is it proper? Is it the way you would have me to think until you get here for me, Lord? What's happened to me? What am I like? Hallelujah. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Oh. I never liked holiness, some would say. I never thought it was important. But Jesus said, if you'll put on that new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness is created after God, the new man. Jesus made you a new creature. Where is that new man? I'm afraid you've been putting the new man off and keeping the old man. Go find the new man and say, that's what I'm keeping. Throwing the old man off. The new man. I know you're saved. I know. But this is what you do after you're saved. After you're saved, you put on the new man, which is created in, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You put that on. Well, but Sister Linda, what if I don't even know what to think? That's better than thinking the way the old man did. It's better than saying, well, Lord, give me my thoughts. Let me grow up into your head and let me realize what you would have me to think. How you would have me to see things. You know, a lot of people glory in how in tune they are with the world. You know, they'll say somebody's name and I'll go, I don't know who that is. Oh. Uh, and they'll say it. And everybody else say, yeah, yeah. They all know. I don't know. Why? I don't care about it. I don't want those kind of things in my mind. I don't need them. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Lord, I'm starting today 
to be renewed in the spirit of my mind. Okay, we're going to turn one more place, Galatians 2 and 20. It's right before Ephesians. 2 and 20. And this is how to be ready for Jesus to come. For you. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Is that good enough, brother? Huh? Is it good enough for you? Is it good enough, Sister Tammy? I'm crucified with Christ, yet nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ. Is he good enough to take over? Hmm? To inhabit? To live through me? And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, here's where you start. You start realizing Without Jesus, I have no life. I have no, I have nothing without Him. And because He died for me, I allow my old self to be crucified too. That's what we did when we got baptized. We said, the old man's dead. New man's alive. But we forget. And we think, I've got to just live like I've always done. You know, because I don't know how else to do it. Yes, you do. Today you do. Today you say, Lord, I want to have the mind of Christ. Nothing else will do. And Jesus said He gave us the mind of Christ. He'll give you that mind if you so want it. But if your mind is so much more interesting and pleasing to you, where you think it's the very best way to, for you to live, and you don't want to throw it off, how are you going to be ready when He comes? How? Are you going to be ready when Jesus comes? One more place. I think I said that was the last place, but this is the last place. Revelation chapter 3. And verse 10. Jesus said this. He said, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, It's going to take patience. It's going to take getting still. It's going to take coming off of those headphones. It's going to take thinking about things other than worldly things. It's going to take thinking about your Savior, your Bridegroom, and what He might want you to be, how He might want you to think. But Sister Linda, I've been thinking this way for 30 years. Yes. The old man has got to go. The old man. He said, because you've kept the word of my patience. Jesus said it in Revelation 3. He said, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. 
and I will write upon him my new name. Jesus is asking you this morning, are you willing? Are you willing to patiently put on the new man? To discover what's in my mind of the old man and to rip it out. I just heard a thought. It was, I don't understand. Don't let that thought stay there. Your mind is not darkened. You do know. You do understand. You understand that the Word of God teaches about a, a life of walking with Christ, of following Jesus, not messing around anywhere you want to and then coming back on Sunday, but following Jesus every day of your life. That's what the Bible describes, teaches us about. And He wants you to keep the Word of His patience. It takes patience. It takes patience to pray. It takes patience to read the Word and try to understand what He wants you to do. It takes patience to be willing to change. Open up your heart today and say, Jesus, put your mind here for me. Your mind for me. That's all. If there's anybody who would like to come to the altar and lay that old man down, I want you to come. Just come to do that. Lord, I lay the old man down. Anybody. Anybody. Anybody want to lay the old man down? I want to go in the rapture. I want to go. Lord, I want to go. Lord, I lay the old man down. I know you can help me. I know you can let me have the mind of Christ. He loves you, 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 Just Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give me the mind of Christ, Jesus. Give me the mind of Christ. My mind, my mind has been running wild. So I ask for my mind to be drawn to you and do that which pleases in your sight. Let me be very much your bride. Let me be yours. I don't have to be the life of the Lord. Let me be yours. Let me speak your words. Let me do what you want me to do. Tell him, Clayton. Let me be what you want me to be. Lord, I give up. I give my own ways up. That's the old one. I want to be new. I want to be new. In righteousness and true holiness. Who am I hungry? I want to be that. The Lord, I praise you. Right here. 
at this altar, I put it down. Lord, I rise up. I need it Lord, I look for you. Let me grow up into your mind. Let me grow up into your mind. Let me not think what you Oh, I let it in the vehicle. I don't it in
love each other. Thank you, Jesus. See you tonight, 6.30. God bless you.